The Land at Scale program aims to strengthen essential land governance components for men, women and youth to contribute to structural, just, sustainable and inclusive change at scale in lower and middle income countries, regions and landscapes. This program is supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands and the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Knowledge management is essential to the effective implementation of the Land at Scale program. It is conceived in a comprehensive and adaptive way that integrates documentation, learning and sharing. Knowledge management means bringing in state-of-the-art insights to strengthen interventions, reaching out to make relevant knowledge available to the right people at the right time, and sharing lessons learned in the program with a wide audience. In this series of short videos, we explore three key aspects of the knowledge management program within Land at Scale. These are adaptive programming, South-South exchange, and monitoring and evaluation. Each of the video presents evidence and insights from experts working in the land governance sector. This video is focused on adaptive programming and how it is informed by knowledge management. Adaptive programming uses lessons learned throughout an intervention to adjust the program for continued effectiveness of program outcomes. In this video, we have asked a range of questions to partners to gain insights about their experiences. I think we um, we use adaptive um, management in, in two ways. Uh, it really depends on the focus of the program. So for legend, the knowledge management was um, often about evidence across countries, not just in a single country. Um, and it was about uh, disseminating information to a wide range of stakeholders. So that was, we, we would uh, use, use our experience mainly um, to think about which, you know, which audience we were trying to reach um, and also which were the topics that were coming up in, in debates where we were um, identifying gaps in the evidence. And then we would build on that knowledge because as we filled in gaps in the evidence, we would often identify further, further questions um, so that's one, one way that we would use that process to, to adapt. Um, in, you know, in, the, in the context of Prindex, where we're much more directly engaged with, with country actors um, and helping to, do, you know, or to support the design of targeted effective program interventions, that's very much about making sure that um, we select the, you know, the, the right in-country partners and that we, we rely on them to, to, to guide us um, about what are the burning questions um, in their own context. Um, but again, using, using the research that we produce to, to identify where the, the main levers may be and what are the, the main issues that need to be addressed. So, for example, with uh, Prindex's first global database based on citizens' perceptions of tenure security, we were able to identify where, uh, you know, which countries have particularly high levels of tenure insecurity, and then use that to guide um, efforts to focus on particular countries for deep dive efforts to, uh, to dig deeper into those questions. So, for example, um, Burkina Faso, which has the highest level of um, tenure and security across the 140 countries surveyed. Uh, we're now working with uh, the German government um, to understand what drives insecurity in Burkina Faso. Really, legend as a whole had to adapt considerably to uh, circumstances that changed quite radically from when it was designed and, and during the first year of implementation. And really, we uh, had to focus on um, developing really background policy knowledge, um, some additional research, you could call it knowledge management, 
um, drawing on the practical experiences of land programs throughout the world, but particularly DFID land programs, active research uh, into you know, emerging issues um, such as land corruption, um, advancing technology and its applications in land administration, and particularly around um, questions of responsible agricultural investment or responsible land-based investment uh, in developing countries, particularly in Africa. And that was the kind of policy focus that DFID wanted. So legend as a whole had to adjust to that. Um, and in order to try to support informed, well-informed and effective intervention strategies or provide some basis for DFID or its successor organization, the FCDO, to do that in practice and for its partners to do that. Um, that did involve quite a lot of knowledge management work, uh, background research uh, and publications, a strong effort on communicating these and sharing these with key stakeholders, particularly DFID, who were the main audience. Uh, there were secondary audiences, you know, including civil society, including the private sector, uh, but really the and, and other international organizations and donors, but the main audience were the DFID advisors, both in country and at the center. The, the thematic area where we work is really complex. Securing tenure is a complex issue and it cross a court. There is sometimes political, there are sometimes uh, um, cross across different social and institutions. So this complexity comes with a lot of authenticity and how this uh, project or our programs are unfolding in the different contexts. And uh, what are the different enabling environment or conditions that will help us uh, to fulfill uh, or achieve our target. So one key aspect in, in this uh, is what are the political environment? Is the political environment conducive enough? What are the different socio-ecological context that we work? And what is the capacity of the, uh, our partners vis-a-vis -vis their relations with other stakeholders and their constituencies where they work to, to move this. So these are the key elements that we take it in, in order to understand how we can adapt project. And in the tenure facility program, um, so far we've been able in practice, try to um, bring this into the different project that we support. For example, one key element is during this COVID, our project and partners, they, they really suffered a lot during COVID. And it was a high time, how do we adapt the project and to really accommodate the pandemic and then they, so that we can do implementation. One of the key elements we do, we had a, a, booth, a, a budget, we look at the, the, the project cost and budget and maybe extend some percentage of the budget where the partners can use it to support their consistencies to be their preparedness to face the COVID, which was not part of uh, the, the project planning. Another aspect of adaptation that we, we really do is that, how do we bring um, um, uh, government and government agency together to work with our partners and so that they can be part of this so we create spaces for dialogue when there is a political tension. The third element is that we, we enable our partners, support our partners to be able to adapt their project to the, 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 the uniqueness of their context. I, um, in ILC, uh, knowledge management plays uh, an important role. 
um, for uh, the network. Uh, in fact, ILC is a coalition of members, um, which is now uh, composed of more than 300 um, members in between civil society organizations, people's organizations, multilateral institutions, international NGOs, research centers, etc. Uh, so knowledge management and learning are in fact adapted uh, in ILC to this particular nature of uh, ILC being a network. So uh, because um, we really want to uh, promote uh, knowledge exchange and learning between ILC members, uh, we do our best to create uh, space and uh, channels through which this can happen. For, for the overall project implementation, knowledge management is absolutely key. Uh, and it is important that it is done systematically and you have a way of you know, reflecting on the learning, uh, reflecting on the knowledge that you are gathering um, to be able to identify the most important questions um, that you then need to look at to be able to tailor your, your project interventions. Uh, in, in our case, um, I have, when I think about legend, uh, we, we pressed pause about halfway through the, the project. In the first part of the project, the efforts on knowledge management had been about generating a lot of new evidence. And then we, we felt that we um, needed to, to pivot to be able to use and apply that evidence more um, more concretely, more systematically to, to reach a wider set of audiences and to make sure that the evidence was relevant for, um, for those debates. And that was done very, you know, very closely in partnership with the, the UK government, which um, is, is very keen on adaptive, uh, adaptive management, recognises the need for that. Um, so that was a really uh, useful example for us of, of how we were working closely with the donors um, to be able to reflect on what we had done. Uh, I think in that, that moment that we pressed pause to reflect, we also realized that uh, we needed to, to group our, 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 our efforts, um, our learning um, into a few more focused points, we reflected on, you know, which, which products, um, which evidence had had the most impact, um, had been most relevant to, um, to people's thinking and practice. And then we were able to draw on that learning to say, right, these are the areas that we're going to be focusing on it over the next two or three years. And I would thoroughly recommend that that you know, that there, there are moments for pause and, and reflection built into any, any project um, with the ability to, to actually look honestly at what, what you're doing and say, well, we tried that. It wasn't successful, but that's fine. At that, you know, what were the learnings that we got from that that we can apply going, going forwards and have that, that, that honest and um, honest conversation in a safe space. So knowledge management didn't really play a very systematic role across legend as a whole in reflecting and learning about project implementation. It was more reflection and learning about policy and learning from other projects, other activities and factoring that knowledge into DFID's resource bank and their planning. But we were able to spend some time focusing on the lessons from the major DFID land programs that had taken place in the previous, over the previous five to 10 years, and those that were still ongoing, to really look closely at the outcomes, largely based on um, evaluation reports, review reports, existing documentation, but also drawing on the team's knowledge, and in particular bringing in uh, people who were directly engaged in implementation of these programs. So we are just um, a, a funding mechanism and we provide technical support. And then we ensure that 
our partners integrate learning as a key element in their project monitoring and evaluation. In going forward, we are developing certain guidelines on how we better support structured and streamline our project and partners to be able to, to conduct this type of um, learning in a sequence uh, uh, manner during the project cycle. In terms of changing program strategy, um, the the reflection and and learning have um, you know have definitely led to to either either a pivot um, or a narrowing of of focus. Uh, when we were working, you know, when, in the first couple of years of of Prindex, there was there was a huge amount of learning um, about again the the audiences the most relevant um, questions. And um, we, we have you know, often had these moments of, of reflection, uh, actually not necessarily in the same way as we did with legend, sort of pressing pause to reflect, um, but more about continuous reflection and learning with, with monthly meetings, um, you know, longer, more extended, um, uh, six monthly meetings and then constant refreshing of our strategy. So we have an integrated research communications and, and funding strategy and constantly checking in to see whether we were achieving those aims. So looking at the communication statistics, looking at which research had most impact and then thinking about how to plan our resources for the next six months um, to be able to build on that on that learning. So one of the issues that we, um, we had when, when we first started with Prindex, I mean, Prindex started as a way of responding to the needs um, for data for SDG indicator 1.4.2 and 5.A1. Um, and we, we realized quite quickly that, um, that we needed to expand our focus way beyond that. That, the, um, that our data would be very, very important for more citizen-led efforts to, to set up a data ecosystem that we could feed into efforts to, um, to inform on the progress of the voluntary guidelines. And that most importantly, that our data was going to be um, important for, for citizens, uh, academics, um, and government officials to think about national, national policy. And um, again, quite quickly, we realized that having nationally representative samples uh, was a really important way to identify the scale and the nature of the problem of tenure insecurity, but then we needed to dive into particular countries quickly to be able to get more uh, regionally you know, or, or intra-country um, representative samples. Yeah, there were two uh, challenge fund projects in Sierra Leone, and I think uh, you know both of them have generated lessons and wider interest and experience in Sierra Leone and amongst both the NGOs and the companies involved, which is very very positive, and see other stakeholders in Sierra Leone and other international stakeholders are now looking at those lessons. Uh, so that is clearly a win. So the bulletin <clears throat> played a key role in communicating a wide range of up-to-date information from the program and from other sources um, to DFID and highlighting issues that DFID advisors at country level or in the center specialist advisors might well be interested in. Uh, but we tried to craft that bulletin in such a way um, that it would be readable and interesting to a much wider audience as well. Uh, and so in terms of fairly up-to-date reporting <clears throat> on developments on the ground in context, a lot of effort went into that. Uh, and I think it produced good results in its own terms. We have cases 
uh, or uh, um, different cases in that our project that the political climate and the, the political environment really affected project implementation as a key challenge. And most of the, our panel have been able to maneuver that challenge. One way is through dialogue team. It's really important to emphasize this. One way is to identify uh, land tenure champions within the government agency and within the different government settings as entry points to, to, to start uh, initiating this type of dialogue and bringing, on, uh, bringing certain understanding why this is really important. There are challenges when you do have, when you're adapting your strategy, because often your original strategy is based on um, a particular team structure and composition. It's based on assumptions of, of networks that you will need um, and the, the entry points, um, and then the resource allocation that underpins all of that. So when you do change your strategy, you have to look at all, all of those different components and say, do we still have the right team structure and composition? Do we need to either bring in new people or change what the existing team is already doing? Um, you then need to look at your networks and again, you know, verify whether they are, are fit for purpose, whether you need to expand them, whether you need to focus in on particular, particular actors. Um, and it takes time um, to, to develop new networks and build up you know, a relationship of trust and establish your credibility in those networks. And certainly we have found that, um, again, we, you know, with, with Prindex, we have had to be very, very agile um, very responsive to new new opportunities that we think um, need to be uh, need to be addressed, um, and that yes, I think the, the the so these internal processes of of uh, changing resource allocation, which which can be done reasonably easily, and if you have the whole team on board and you have a very strong program management capacity then you can, you, you can do that fairly, um, fairly quickly. I think it is that, um, that more externally focused change that can take more time. And that really does need to be built into um, any adaptation um, that, that a program is, is, is uh, taking on board. And that needs to be a, you know, that there needs to be strong support from the funders for that program to, to do that in recognition of the time that it can take. And uh, we are in the process of revising our, developing our new strategy. And I think we, during this process, we are taking into consideration all these practical examples. And we are also uh, involving our partners into our um, strategic um, uh, process which is happening now to also give inform us with all these um, examples and the different um, uh, scenarios in what they have happened in their project. So this information will help us to systematically revise and develop the new strategy for 2023 to 2028, which will really be informed by the lessons in this study and with the contribution of our project partners. <laughs>